everybody. Welcome along. You are watching a session at the Harassus India meeting coming to you online. And this session is entitled Preparing for the Next Pandemic. And I have to admit, it does seem strange to be addressing this topic uh, currently, as we do not seem to be quite through the current COVID-19 pandemic. However, there is plenty for us to discuss, lots to consider, lots that we've learned so far. And certainly we will start to discuss that today. Let me um, just introduce myself. I'm Hannah Wise. I'm an international news journalist based in Zurich in Switzerland. Um, I've worked at the BBC in London in at France 24 in Paris over the years as well. And I find myself now with CNN Money Switzerland covering business news for the most part um, from Zurich. And we have quite an international panel for you today. So let me just introduce everybody. I'm going to start um, to, in the mid, top middle. We have Carlos Centus. He is the founder of World Impact Alliance, which works on social impact projects and global campaigns to make the world a better place. And he's joining us from Madrid in Spain. Welcome to you, Carlos. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, next to Carlos, we have um, we have Gulu Lalvani. He is a business leader from the United Kingdom. He's now based in Thailand and is chairman of the Royal Phuket Marina, from where he joins us today. Welcome to you, Gulu. Thank you, Hannah. And, and on the bottom left, we have Pratik Gauri. He is a rising entrepreneurial leader in India with a large social media presence and reach. He's he has founded a portfolio of purpose-driven companies in the fifth industrial revolution, which we will discuss later, I'm quite sure. And he's helping to achieve the UN SDGs, uh, or has been in the last decade. He serves as the India CEO of the Fifth Element Group, which is a global impact and management consultant. And he joins us from Delhi. Pratik, welcome to you. Thank and you. finally, we have Ijaz Ahmad. He is the award-winning president of the Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center. Now, he's an economist, he's an entrepreneur, and he built that center back in 2009 with a vision to create a more just, prosperous, and inclusive society by training the next generation of leaders. And he joins us from California, where it is incredibly early in the morning. So our special thanks to you, Ijaz, for staying up so late. Thank Let's you, that kick off then. We may have another uh, visitor joining us a little bit later, but for now it's just going to be us five. And I'm going to start by asking you very, very briefly, if we can start with you, Carlos, first of all, I mean, and uh, how, how, has, how has this COVID-19 pandemic affected you and your business? Well, first of all, I think some of us are extremely lucky that we have been affected uh, in only a few aspects of our life. Uh, we see that there's billions of people that are affected because they were already suffering very big, difficult, very big difficulties. So for us, it has only been a matter of uh, rethinking our strategy. And I think that this uh, pandemic gives us all a very narrow window of, of opportunity to rethink how can we reform our political, economic, and our social structures. And uh, what that means is that uh, in our organization and every other organization, we should be thinking, what is our role in this new world that is coming? How are we going to deal with the technological disruption and all the disruption from the pandemic? And so what we are doing is using this time to improve our uh, projects, to expand our networks, to make sure that every initiative that we launch is going to maximize the positive impact that it generates in the world. So instead of doing uh, the, the business as usual and just have this year as a, a normal uh, working year, what we decided to do is to go back to the laboratory and think, with this new situation, what can we do that would maximize the impact and how can we prepare ourselves for the future? So it has been, uh, we have been affected, of course, like everybody else, but we decided to take this opportunity and instead of trying to launch our projects, we decided to prepare better initiatives. So there's two things that we have been doing. One is preparing our uh, basis for the new education system that we are advocating for. And we are working a lot on that. So when the crisis is gone or uh, when the crisis gets better, we can start uh, pushing it. And the other thing is we're developing a technological platform that allows to connect problems with problem solvers. So basically breaking down big problems into smaller tasks that allow people to be a part of the solution. So instead of just trying to launch and to fight against the world, being the world uh, as the way 
it is right now, we decided to work on those things and to start again stronger whenever this ends. So it's a time for reflection, contemplation, and how we take our next steps for you, Carlos. What about Absolutely. you, Gulu? I mean, how, how has this COVID pandemic been for you? That's a good question, Hannah. As you all know, Phuket is a very tourism-related place. I mean, 70% of its uh, GDP depends on tourism. And since uh, end of March, tourism didn't drop by 50% or 80%, dropped 99%. So the tourism part of the business is badly affected, which means our marina is the best award-winning marina in Thailand. And so about 60% of the business comes through tourism. 40% is owner-occupied yachts, which are individually owned by um, wealthy people around the world who come and enjoy themselves here. So that revenue has not been affected. But this is a mixed use marina. Marina is a center point, and we have, I dwell a property, apartments, which are all sold individually, and we manage for the owners. But that's not been as badly affected because owners can't travel, plane, there's no international flights yet. So to say, yes, this is, thank God we didn't have any borrowings on the company from any banks. Otherwise, we would be in cash flow crisis, like many businesses are. But I'd absolutely, look, I mean, uh, I'd Gulu, I would be sorry. to hear a little bit more about how the tourism industry can protect itself in the future, and that's certainly something that we're going to come back to um, during the course of this uh, little uh, session. But if I could just turn to you, Ijaz, how have you been affected by COVID nineteen? Uh, thanks, uh, Hannah. Although I'm in California, my work is based in Bangladesh. You know, my family is here, but I, I, I spend most of the year in Bangladesh, where I run the Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center. And uh, for the past four months, I was there navigating our work in Bangladesh. We work with young people. We give skills to young people. We engage them in jobs. We help them become entrepreneurs. Now, in a country like Bangladesh and in South Asia, uh, the vast majority of our population is below the age of 25. So young people have been hit very badly. Uh, education has been disrupted. So we have been moving all of our courses online. Uh, unemployment has been a huge issue uh, in countries like Bangladesh. Uh, how do you rethink your education? How do you uh, engage young people in unemployment? That's something that we've been grappling with. Uh, and as you know, in, in Bangladesh, uh, more than 80% of our export earnings comes from the ready-made garments, the textile sector, that has been badly hit. Another major revenue driver is the foreign remittance of migrant workers. They've all been coming back from Europe, from Middle East. So there has been widespread unemployment in the country, and that has taken a toll on the young generation. So that's something uh, on a macro level we are grappling with. Uh, on the education side, we have launched an online academy trying to democratize education, shift education to online. So that's one area that we've been working on uh, to, to, to address the current crisis. And, uh, and beyond the scope of our work, Hannah, I think, you know, what COVID-19 has done for us is it has taught us that uh, without being dependent on the government, we have to do our part. So another major stream of our work has been in the distribution of food uh, to people who overnight became uh, homeless, poor. And uh, so that has been another uh, strand of our work over the past four months. So food distribution to vulnerable population, upskilling young people, thinking about you know, jobs and entrepreneurship. That's what's been keeping me busy uh, since COVID-19 started. Thank you, Ijaz. How about you, Pratik? Uh, so thanks, Hannah. So um, uh, I think uh, COVID, uh, what that's done, so in, in fact, uh, just to build on what Carlos was saying, uh, I, we have been very, um, um, you know, tr we've been trying to actually uh, do the strategy piece right now and not get too much into the execution piece because uh, there was lockdown um, in India and um, it was not advised to go out and most of our work actually happens on the ground. So uh, just to what Ijaz was also saying. So it wasn't actually possible. So we were affected. There's no doubt about it. But just to give you some glimpses of what we, uh, so you know, what we've been able to do. So I've been actually trying to propagate what they call the fifth industrial revolution. Um, and I think COVID is actually helping transition us from the fourth uh, to the fifth industrial revolution, where 
um, uh, we've kind of proven that companies can, if they focus on impact, they can actually make more profits. And it's very evident with some of the initiative that came out um, of ours during COVID. So I don't know if you guys have heard of Some Good News, which is, became a global news phenomena run by John Krasinski. So we at Fifth Element Group were, played a very vital role in actually creating Some Good News with John. And um, I don't know if you guys know, but there were like 11 episodes, um, millions of views. And it was just such a uh, remarkable uh, piece um, uh, which came out in, in these tough times. And we built that and now it's been sold to Viacom. So it clearly shows you that you can actually create more profits, more revenues, uh, even in COVID if you're doing, if you're actually wanting to create impact. But that's just one. Um, but you have to be flexible, you have to be agile, you have to be ready for that change. And that's the key thing, isn't it, in a pandemic? You never know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and I think about agility, that's why. So, you know, one of my companies, actually, we were um, we had signed eight contracts to execute stuff on the ground in India, and we couldn't do it because of COVID. But then what we did is we um, uh, went to, um, you know, designing the strategy pieces, we opened up three virtual offices. So we're moving from, you know, uh, the real offices implementation to virtual and we've, and we've dis we're discovering that um, it's not that bad productivity. In fact, the productivity is not suffering at all. We're still making profits. We're still, rest to your point on agility, we closed our angel round in one of my companies. So we completed our angel round. So we've been doing stuff. Uh, then we launched another uh, media uh, channel um, in India about with, with uh, FinTech TV. So to amplify finance stories and FinTech stories, because I think that's going to play a huge role, specifically with financial inclusion. Um, and I'm talking you know, India specific with Facebook and everybody putting in billions of dollars um, into financial inclusion as well. When we talk about preparing for the next pandemic, I mean, certainly there's been a lot of successes. You've just explained some of them, Pratik, there. I mean, many businesses have had to refocus uh, or even pivot during the crisis. I mean, we saw from car parts to ventilators, from high fashion to face masks, you know, all these companies are suddenly trans and just morphing into something else. They're trying to do something for a social good, but also they need to make money during, during uh, this period of time. And I think this is a crucial question for you, Gulu. I really wonder how you can protect yourself as a tourism, as a tour in the tourist industry. How can you protect yourself in the future from this? What can you do that will, you know, stop 99% of your business from disappearing next time there is a pandemic? Correct. That's an excellent question again. One thing that this COVID-19 taught us is that you can work not only from home, but you can work from anywhere in the world these days. Like I am doing from Phuket, I'm also conducting business of my companies in London, Hong Kong. And in the last three months, well, three months ago, I never knew how to use Zoom. Now I'm on Zoom day and night. And it's nearly, I would say, 80 to 90% as, as efficient as virtually being there. So I'm finding more and more people were getting inquiries from the real estate side. People want to rent or buy homes because the cost of living is much cheaper than wherever they are and conduct business from here and live in, there's no pollution here, air quality, air quality index, which comes on CNN every day. We have the lowest in Phuket compared to China and India as the highest pollution. So this is where I think people are looking to realize and buy homes or rent homes and have that family here. It becomes a holiday home. The main home can be wherever it is. India, Hong Kong, China, wherever it is. So this is how well, uh, there's a new area, which is there's a new area which is gonna open up. People never imagined working from somewhere else until this COVID. So COVID has taught us the thing but the, so the holiday home becomes um, a kind of alternative yeah. business place, so less of a holiday home, just I'm more of a second not, home, I guess. Honestly, I'm not missing. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a for future. Okay, well, um, I'd just like to introduce then Yatindra R. Sharma. Um, hello, welcome, Yatindra. I see that you managed to join us. I'm not sure if you can hear me quite yet. Can you give us a yeah, wave if you can hear you. Still having a fiber cable network, uh, could not get in, so I had to try my mobile phone to get it connected. 
Okay, well, we appreciate everything that you've gone to. It's quite something to get used to this technology. And uh, let me just introduce you, um, Yatindra. You're the managing director of KHS India, which is uh, the machine process company manufactures and markets beverage process and packaging plants. And actually, um, Yatindra, it was originally uh, established in Germany. Um, so I feel that, that you're a little bit closer to me here in Switzerland. But um, from where are you joining us today, Yatindra? I'm joining from my plant. But in which part of the world? It is Ahmedabad, India. Ah, okay, great. Well, it's, I'm delighted to welcome you. Um, some of the things that we've been talking about is how we've been affected by COVID-19 and how we can um, prepare ourselves, of course, as the title would suggest of this session, for the next pandemic. Um, how have you found, what's your experience been during COVID-19? Yeah, it has been a kind of a revelation that uh, how far people can go against nature and what kind of implications it can have. Absolutely unprecedented, where not even happening in decades. I mean, it has happened in a century. It is the event of the century. And for 90 days, practically the human life, economy, everything comes to standstill. And then you take a calibrated move which to open and what to open and how to take care and people are cloistered uh, in their homes and you know going out with the mask and all kind of uh, precautions but still everybody is uh, driven by the fear of unknown but from and a business from a business perspective you tindra i'm sorry to interrupt but um you obviously are, are dealing with the beverage industry i mean are you how impacted have you been by the fact that supply chains have been disrupted so much. We have been impacted as an industry. 90 days has been a period for beverage industry anywhere in the world, which is known as the season manufacturing and sales time. And this is the time where industry has lost entire production. Markets are closed, outlets are closed, shops are closed. So what to do? So it has been a very catastrophic for people in industry. Also in terms of human safety, uh, the way in which India did lockdowns, everything went well till lockdown three. And in lockdown four, when economy was given priority and people started moving out and, you know, taking a kind of calibrated call to start their economic activities. We can see that the number of cases, everything has scaled up. The saving grace in India right now is that the mortality rate is low. So far as our operations are concerned, we do not have any mortality at the moment, even after 90 days. Uh, we have been able to start our operations from April, but with very reduced capacity. But... We have been uh, taking care of some of the export business right now and also the local business in month of June has started picking up gradually. But everybody is speculating how far we will go because people are not sure whether this pandemic will continue till when and whether it is going to vanish or whether it is going to reappear. Now that is one thing. Secondly, about pandemic uh, for the future, I think it has raised many questions. Likewise, politicians, economy, society at large, everybody will have to look at and redraw their activities, their plan, their, uh, you know, uh, kind of infrastructure. Everything will have to go through dynamic and I think drastic change. The way of living will be redefined. I think that's actually a very important point, Yatindra, and this is what we would like to talk about next. Uh, you mentioned it there. Gulu just mentioned it. The fact that technology is really shaping how we've dealt with this pandemic, but also how we will be prepared for the next pandemic. Um, perhaps if I can start with you, Pratik, um, how, how will technology shape how we can deal with this in the future? 
So I think uh, uh, technology is definitely going to play a huge, huge role, but um, it's going to be um, a little different from what we were already doing. So it's going to be the same technology that, which we have already um, invented in the fourth industrial revolution, which are AI, IoT, and blockchain, and 3D printing, and robotics. But uh, rather than um, just concerning, uh, rather than just uh, you know taking care of profits and giving more returns to stakeholders, we have to be very. I think this pandemic has definitely taught us that we need to take care of nature and environment and and other impact parameters. And I see a lot of investors now would be posing more trust into ESG investing, uh, which is environmental, social, and governance. And you would see a lot of uh, startups. Um, uh, you know, the, the, when, when you're talking about funded startups, a lot of startups, you know, working in the spaces of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, using technology, as, as you just mentioned, you know, using all these uh, frontier tech, fourth industrial revolution technology to solve problems like water or sanitation or uh, gender equality or climate change or solar or wind. I think we will see a huge rise in these particular spaces and most of the unicorns I particularly feel when it comes to the startup space are going to emerge in these particular spaces. And that's what um, we call the fifth industrial revolution. Carlos, uh, let's bring you back at this point. I mean, this is very much what your company is doing. Um, and this idea that technology is one thing, but it, everything must be purpose driven in the future. Is that a trend that you're seeing? Absolutely. And uh, our uh, co-pilot said it very, very well. I think one of the biggest issues right now is how can we really rearrange both the resources and also the people's power in order to uh, actually solve the problems. And what we see is that there's millions of people in the world that are clearly inclined to do something that is good for the world, but they have not been able to see what is the benefit or what is exactly what they can do. So the biggest purpose that we have right now is how can we make sure that people know exactly what they can do. So what companies can do that is profitable and can generate an impact, as, as he said, also, what can institutions and politicians do that is going to maximize the, the, the positive contributions that they do to society in a manner that is interesting for their own personal careers? And also, how, how can we make sure that individuals everywhere know exactly what they can do? So one example is, if I am an engineer, what problems require some engineering skills and knowledge that could uh, I participate in? And so how can we make sure that everyone has a very clear sense of not only what I can do with my skills and in issues that I am concerned about, but also maybe is there any possibility of giving them any reward? Mm -hmm. So this is a concept that we have created, which is public-private social collaboration, where you allow individuals and societies to be part of the solution. And it's clear that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a great reference for all of us, but sometimes we lack certainty or clarity on what is exactly what I can do as an individual or as a communicator. You work in a large network and you have your voice heard, but what is it that you could be saying? What is it that the politician should be uh, proposing? What is it that the business owner should be doing so the business grows and at the same time you can generate an impact? There's millions of examples I would like to share, but I think uh, the, the biggest focus should be how can we make it accessible? We have Wikipedia for knowledge. We have many uh, systems that allow us to, for example, uh, raise funds. So we have Kickstarter and others. We have crowdsourcing platforms where you can offer your services or hire services. We have all these technologies, but we don't have a single space where you see, okay, or from the UN or international organizations or private initiatives, what are exactly the tasks that we have in each of those fields of this? I, I will finish in a second, Hannah. Uh, of those fields that uh, are part of the SDGs, what are exactly the tasks that we could do? And with those tasks clear, then everybody can move. And what the COVID crisis has shown is that we have billions of people engaged in technological cooperation and AI for good to actually solve this problem. But this should be applied to all the problems, not only the COVID. So do you think that there isn't enough leadership when it comes to driving purpose and profit? Absolutely. I think we have seen how our political leaders are very good at winning elections and they are definitely not so interested in actually managing crisis or, or seeing future crisis because they don't see the political interest. And that's my biggest concern. How can we make them interested and engaged and how can we make it so when they do something that is actually useful for their countries and for the world, that is going to be beneficial for them. So when we propose a, a, a law, for example, 
a new regulation on the new education system or whatever it is, it needs to be really appealing for their borders. So they actually think that this is something that has to do with them. The last thing I would say is that this uh, leadership that we have right now has shown that because they are so used to just talking about things and not actually executing, they don't have real world experience. What we want to propose is how can we use technology to make democracies more participative? No one can say that democracy is perfect. It's the best of the systems that we have, but it's definitely not perfect. Technology can allow us to be more participative and show exactly what we care about the problems that we have. And also, we can all perfectly well nominate what are the candidates that we believe are the most qualified for the task, not the ones that you have in the right wing or the left wing. And it's the only choice you have in four years is to choose two, two people that you probably don't even like. But maybe if we mm -hmm. have the possibility of crowd uh, select some candidates that we believe have the right skills and the right capacity, maybe we have a better leadership there's no interest right now from the biggest, uh, most qualified people to actually do this job. And it's only people that have political interest and, and they want to do it, the ones that run. And, and that's one of the biggest issues that we think we should f focus on. Uh, that's a very interesting. I mean, Ijaz, this is uh, your wheelhouse, absolutely. Um, if you think about the leaders who've been successful during this current um, crisis, Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand, Angela Merkel, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, I named some women, of course. Um, yeah. But, uh, Ijaz, who are the leaders then of the future? Are they ones who have a lot more social responsibility? Is that what we care about more now? I think uh, that's, a, that's a great question. The, the first job of any leader, I believe, uh, as a student of leadership, and I've been teaching this for 12 years, is to present the correct reality to the people. I think when you are ready to face the reality and present the reality without misguiding people, without not telling people the truth. And if you look at uh, countries that have done the worst, you mentioned some of the countries that have done the best in, uh, in addressing this COVID-19. I am right now speaking from a country where the president himself does not wear the mask. And what do you expect from citizens uh, if, if the leader of the country does not set the right kind of example? So I think the first thing is the, the, the job of leadership is to present the right reality and to model the behavior. If I expect something from others, I must practice that. Because people follow what you do, not what you say. I think our actions speak louder than words. So I think uh, practicing the right kind of behavior is important for leadership. And, and also, uh, you know, what COVID-19 has taught us is it's not possible for a single leader to make the difference. Leadership has to be distributed at all levels. We cannot just be dependent on governments to solve our problems. If, if you and I just sit here and blame our governments that they're not doing the job right, that's not going to solve the problem. So I think the idea of leadership, that anyone has the capacity to exercise leadership for the common good, has to be uh, widely practiced in society. If each one of us does our bit, with responsibility, as you said, being fruitful, having the right kind of values with the right intention and purpose, then I think we can make a difference. And Gulu, if I can turn to you now, um, this pandemic, this, this session, you know, starts with the, the, the words that we're woefully underprepared, or we were woefully underprepared for this pandemic. Uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has been um, widely criticized for its mishandling. Um, do you think that's fair, that they mishandled this crisis, Gulu? Well, there has been some criticism from leaders like uh, Trump. But I thought my impression, without being influenced by what we read from Trump, I think they did a good job. But because this is the world's first in our lifetime event, yes. It came as a surprise, maybe it was much bigger than people thought. But I'm all for World Health Organization. I think overall they're brilliant, but there has been some criticism. So therefore, I may be 10% doubt. But overall, I think this is a great organization. It's been going on for years. And uh, mm -hmm. I would, I do, I've taken uh, many feedbacks. And we've taken our actions based on World Health Organization. There is some talk that they're pro-China. I don't know whether that's how far that's true, but there's all this little politics, as some of the panel has said. So I think overall, they're doing a good job. But we were 
definitely unprepared. Every country was unprepared, sadly. Uh, and for you, Yatindra, I mean, did you follow what the, the World Health Organization said? I mean, it's a pretty tricky job to manage the entire world. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so far as uh, work of WHO is concerned, I think they've done uh, quite well. The major problem while declaring a pandemic, I think the data which was required from China and the transparency of data which was to be shared and which was to be given, I think there has been a lot of uh, reluctance on part of Chinese authorities. And due to that, the declaration of pandemic took place maybe around four weeks late, minimum. And that is something where you can uh, point at WHO in terms of declaring a pandemic. But Otherwise, whatever uh, actions are taken by WHO, the kind of collaborative efforts which have been taken by WHO, and whether it is vaccine initiative, whether it is clinical trials for various medicines which can help uh, to mitigate, uh, you know, Corona, COVID-19 infections, I think uh, they have done a quite uh, significant and good job. And uh, so far as India is concerned, I think uh, they are definitely collaborating very closely with WHO. So we, I don't see any such, uh, you know, lapse on behind, you know, on behalf of WHO. Basically, if you are restrained by data which has to be shared, which has to be conveyed, I think China is the culprit over there. I mean, there is no doubt about it. Whether uh, it is uh, Wuhan virus or uh, I mean, I don't want to get into that debate. But basically, to share this data in time, transparently, I think China has not acted in a fair manner, and that is the reason why the entire world is having such kind of uh, impact all over. Would it have been earlier? World would have a chance to prepare. Uh, just on that then, if I can turn to you, Pratik, um, how do we collaborate? You know, how do the different governments collaborate? How do we work with the World Health Organization? Which leadership should take control? Is it possible and how much does technology actually play in, in that collaboration? So I think uh, I would like to say there are two things that we need to do. Uh, and just building on what uh, uh, the panelists are saying, we need um, to work at the intersection of technology and omniwins. So um, an omniwin is basically a framework where, um, you know, it doesn't need to be a zero sum game. So if two people or three people are partnering, it doesn't have to be somebody's losing or somebody's winning. And just what Carlos was sharing was absolutely right. I actually resonate with what we see in India. Uh, with more young leaders coming to the fore, uh, there needs to. So what I witnessed in the last decade was there were four silos uh, and people working, doing incredible stuff, but doing in silos. So one silo is the government silo um, to which Carlos was saying, politics, et cetera. The second silo is the social entrepreneur silo, which has actually reached on the ground. The third silo is the ultra high net worth sector or people or billionaires or celebrities or family offices. And the fourth silo is the uh, Fortune 500 uh, silo. So everybody in their own ways have contributed to the economy and have been trying to create impact. But what I discovered in the last 10 years, if we can bring all of those four to the same table, which is not easy, by the way, but if we can, and, and when you say World Health Organization, if we can bring all these bodies uh, to work in tandem with the government, in tandem with social entrepreneurs, trying having reach on the ground with social media influencers, um, having reach on social media. And you know, if we can bring all these four together, backed by technology, because technology has given us access to do this easily, then I think um, we are actually moving to a path where it's easier for us to prepare for the next uh, pandemic. So, but how much does technology play in that role? Technology plays a very vital role because you can't bring all of them together without technology. To an extent, if you want to, I mean, uh, social media, just to uh, just give you a small glimpse. I mean, we are talking, we are not even physically present right now. So you can see the use of technology even for us coming together. And even when, if I talk about this panel, there is such diversity. Even if we come together, there's so much more impact that we can create than we are currently creating. So the amplification of impact 
uh, is going to happen at the back end of um, um, at the back end of uh, technology. And also, if you want to basically create impact, I think it has to be the bottom billion. It can't just be uh, some sector of society. Um, you know, becoming more abundant. It has to be the entire world. It has to be the entire six billion or seven billion humans. And if you want to reach all those seven billion humans, it has to be um, through technology. There has to be more financial inclusion. And I think blockchain with decentralization gives us access to actually reach technologies, even make the un so a lot of sector in India. A lot of people are still unbanked. They don't have access to banking. And blockchain, I think, would also enable that as well. So you know, if you can bring those. Um, uh, uh, without spending a lot of money, by the way, it's also cheaper. Technology makes this stuff uh, cheaper as well. So then if you can bring all of them uh, to get banked and then you can access all those people and provide them tools and access and information, then I think we are actually um, moving to a part where we can create an abundant future as well. All right, well, we're running into the last 10 minutes of our panel. So I'd like to kind of get one more question to each of you. Um, and. Gulu, if I can return to you and how you are preparing yeah. for the next pandemic, um, yeah. you've highlighted the, the, the devastation of the tourism industry. Um, and um, how will you future? Is it all about cash reserves? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, before I come to that question, I want to just add something on WHO, please. I personally believe strongly that WHO was made as a scapegoat by Donald Trump and my friends, I'm, I'm a British citizen, Boris Johnson. They both were wholly unprepared on behalf of the countries. I know personally, Donald Trump didn't even attend first five meetings. They're called Cobra meetings, which started from first of uh, end of January. And every meeting, Cobra meeting, Prime Minister, unless he's abroad, has to attend. He took it very lightly. It is only the sixth meeting which was early March that he attended, realized how serious the things were. So this is all so going forward. We, our, our world leaders should certainly so react more quickly. You, yes, to be honest with you, WHO has been a scapegoat by these two countries, I'm part of one country, and uh, therefore there have been other countries been found up against them. I think they did a, did a good job preparing for the next uh, for future. I think reserves even things are good. People take businesses for granted. I believe at least once a year, we should look at worst case scenarios when things are going well to see if, what if something happened and make them reserves every year, like we make contingency reserves for uh, replacing some assets and so on. So that, this is something that has taught us in the future, every business should have this contingency and maybe the government have to give some uh, allowance for tax that you can write off against tax, like you can write off depreciation against tax. So this has to be a must do for every successful business. Okay, thank you, thank you very yeah. much indeed, Gulu. Uh, Yatindra, very briefly, um, when it comes to stockpiling, do you think that our strategic reserves should change? He's on mute. I think. I think you're on mute, actually. If <laughs> you could just unmute. Uh, thank you, Connie C. I will get to your question in just a moment. But um, Yatindra, I just wanted to ask you about strategic reserves and, it, and if those should change going forward. Well, strategic reserves, uh, if at all you are talking about, uh, we have to look at uh, in all aspects. Whether it is economy, whether it is society, whether it is governance, whether it is economy, all put together. And this is something which is going to redefine the way in which we have been living, the way in which the governance is being done, the way in which political decisions are being taken, the way in which uh, industry is running. So far as industry is concerned, because I am part of industry, so point is that I can see that uh, new technologies, the high tech, whether you talk about big data, whether you talk about uh, IoT, all these things are going to redefine the way of business. Likewise, we are right now doing a virtual conference thanks to all these technologies. And this is going to be the norm for many industries. I will not be surprised five years down the line where my air conditioning technician will be sitting there in his office and uh, you know fixing my air conditioning at my home remotely. 
we are already doing remote servicing of our clients right now in this pandemic we are already doing we are doing right now 20 projects sitting in our plant and taking care of customer issues so the point is that technology is going to play a very important role whether it is business meeting whether it is uh, you know the kind of uh, think tank discussions all these things are going to change traveling is going to get reduced people life work life balance is going mm. to change because the kind of revelation what all of us have got being there in our homes more than 60 to 90 days is I going think to we- I think you bring up a very important point, Yatindra. I think you bring up a very important point about the role of technology. Um, and, and just as a question, Connie C has asked, um, and I think Pratik, you're probably the best place to answer this. What kind of technology is needed in the future to deal with a coming pandemic? Well, I think there are going to be, uh, so I, if you were to ask me, I would say frontier tech, but in frontier tech, there would be a lot of, um, a lot of different technologies. As I said, I think blockchain is definitely very, very, um, um, I mean, because blockchain gives you access to decentralize everything and that gives you more speed um, and, you know, the the, the quickness and more, it's, it makes the entire process more swift. So um, I think blockchain would definitely play um, a huge role. But in fact, with blockchain, I think also with a lot of data uh, that we have, I think artificial intelligence is also going to be playing a huge, huge role because uh, if we want to reach the bottom billion, as I again say, because when I talk about impact, we also have to reach those people. And if we want to reach those people, the best way is to also use AI. If through AI, we can, you know, through predictive analysis, there are going to be a lot of predictive analysis happening on big data. And through that, we're going to have mechanisms to actually companies are going to easily reach those consumers and sell them um, their products, which are actually make, uh, going to make their lives um, more abundant. So I would say blockchain, then it will be artificial intelligence. Um, then I would say 3D printing is uh, printing is also going to, I think, um, play um, uh, play a huge, huge uh, role as we as we prepare for the next pandemic. Um, and I, I mean, I, I can name a bunch more, but I think uh, uh, just to sum it up, I, I would say um, just to what Itindra was saying, you know, a uh, blockchain and I, I mean, Frontier Tech is going to give you access to the unbanked and and then you know with, even with if you see uh facebook putting in about um billions of dollars into reliance geo in india right now and they've um they raised billions of dollars and that's just because through technology they are going to un- tap the um the billion population that we have in india and if you can tap those population um, you know bring them to a technology platform because it's not physically present to do that if you can do that even uh, they're trying to build the what we call rural amazon of the world so you know through um, uh, 3d printing you can reach the uh, every consumer and sell them all products and they will get access to all products that we sitting in delhi or mumbai or cities get so um yeah so technology is going to be but with with the rise of technology, especially frontier technology, Ajaj, uh, there comes a huge responsibility. And what role can our leaders play in that? So I think, you know, when you're thinking about leadership and preparing for the next pandemic, you know, you're looking at two things. One is the health side of things. You know, you have to keep people alive. The, the health infrastructure uh, varies greatly between developed and developing countries in countries like India, Bangladesh. You know, we don't have enough ventilators. We don't have enough ICUs in hospitals. So that infrastructure has to be set. That's number one. Second, building on what Pratik said, I am very excited about technology. You know, we, 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 we all love technology, but we must also remind ourselves technology uh, is not an equalizer. Not always, right? If you look at this pandemic, you know, Amazon stock price is going up. Facebook's doing really well. But the bottom half, of the world's population, they've been mm-hmm. worst hit. So how do you ensure that people who will be affected economically in the next pandemic have some, some sort of guaranteed income? And that, I think, will require a lot of compassion, empathy. And we must not forget uh, these values uh, when, we, when we think about preparing for the next pandemic. Of course, the tools, the technology has to be there. But the right kind of leadership with courage, with empathy for other people, with respect, And recognizing that all of us, like all of us in this panel, we are one human family. You know, yeah, that's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us, that we are all in it together and we have to work together and bridge our differences. 
Well, this brings me to you, Carlos. We're, we've really only got a, a less than a minute to go, but how do you close that digital gap then? Education. Is that okay? <laughs> no, I can. I, yes, can, uh, I, know right. how, how, I think I have like 20 seconds. So uh, we need an education that allows us to prepare our new generations and people that are going to be displaced by the convergence of technologies that are going to disrupt all industries to make sure that they have the right skills to deal with the new economic situation that we're going to be with. 40% uh, of jobs are going to change due to not only artificial intelligence, but the cascade of disruption that is going to be provoked, but not only the technology that were mentioned that were very important, but also robotics and also VR, AR, and uh, a bunch of others. And with all that converging together, we are going to see 10 or 20 years of more change than in the last 200 years. And that means that if we continue with a system of education that was created 200 years ago for a completely different world, there is no way on earth we're going to be able to get jobs and get people the, the prosperity that we need. So the two concepts that we uh, advocate for in education is, first of all, you need to give skills, not only knowledge, because knowledge is available. We need to know how to use the knowledge and how to implement it, but we need skills. And that includes coding, that includes public speaking, international relations, social media, and there's a bunch of other skills that are exactly what companies need. You need people that are able to do things and not people that just know things. That's one thing. The second thing is we need to educate people on well-being, including mental health, including uh, how to live a life that makes sense for them. And the third thing is, as uh, it's been mentioned too, is the idea of impact. We need to educate everyone, both our leaders and our uh, future uh, business leaders and, and every citizen and every uh, uh, worker, we need to make sure that when they go to the, to the job market, they know how to prosper. There's many career opportunities. Even if the robots take over, we could be selling robots as long as we are able to sell something. So if we have the skills to sell. So again, it's what we call save the world, make money, be happy as an education concept, regardless of your age, is how can we manage to have the skills to prosper? How can we take care of our mental health and our health? And how can we make an impact with our life? Because without meaning, our lives are absolutely worthless. Well, let, let me just, I'm going to add education. I was trying to come up with some key words that would sum up our panel um, today. And, and certainly technology, collaboration, and education is how we prepare for the next pandemic. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us for this Harassis uh, uh, panel. We've had Pratik Dari, Gula Lavani, Carlos Sentis, Jaj Ahmed, and Yatindra R. Sharma. It's been a wonderful 45 minutes. Uh, and my thanks also to Harassis for uh, uh, organizing this session on preparing for the next pandemic. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it. I'm going to cancel the talk. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank okay. you all so much. Okay. Thank, you. Bye. Thank you, Hannah. Bye. Bye-bye.